ephemeral, most lakes age from 50 to several thousand years, forming simply by the collection of water in depressions and excavations resulting from processes like retreating glaciers, blockages from landslides, pinched off oxbows by meanderous rivers, disappearing as they fill with sediment or dry up due to changes in climate or are covered by advancing glaciers. Spring is a time of aggressive fish activity. Ice atop lakes melts, allowing the wind to infuse oxygen into the water, a secondary source to photosynthesis. Life awakens, like bass and flathead catfish who rouse from quasi-hibernative states. Water temperatures are increasing, and as cold-blooded animals, metabolism is profoundly regulated by external temperatures. Warming high water and fast currents are hallmarks of the snowmelt spring. More waters are connected, dispersing fish throughout these systems. Many of the native species of fish are spring spawners, not lake trout, however. Large concentrations of fish amass late March through May, all expending many calories on courtship rituals and nest building and protection. More important is finding a suitable lake opposed to one many portages out of the way. Classified roughly into three basic categories, there are cold water lakes where salmonids are the dominant sport and commercial species. Warm waters are dominated by sunfishes, walleye, northern pike, and white basses. And two-story waters, with warm water fishes in the upper epilimnion layer and cold water fishes in their depths, the hypolimnion. Cold, oligotrophic waters produce two types of lake trout populations. Populations sustaining primarily on insects and plankton, which tend to be small individually and plentiful, and those that prowl for tula bees, which grow rapidly and are much fewer. Lakes where the only major game fish species is lake trout are typical of plankton-fed populations. Large lakes, surface areas greater than 500 acres, with abundant deep water forage like tula bee, smelt, or whitefish, host trophy-sized lake trout, which also tend to be multi-species bodies of water. When studying a map, start with identifying the deepest water basin, and from there, locate points. Saddles between islands, mid-lake reefs, At this time in the season, mid-spring, all the water is in the trout's preferred temperature range of 45 to 55 degrees, which means the fish could be anywhere in the lake. Woody debris, especially that that's connected to shoreline, is right where to begin sussing out any fish seeking shelter. Bass, particularly will hunker down in all the nooks and crannies provided by such cover in the shallows. Leeward sides of islands are another obvious place to search. Watch out for other animals fishing. They'll give up a few of the lake's secrets. See how this loon surveys the calm water? This comb water allows for the collection of debris as well as a break from any moving water. Shallow waters warm up the quickest, which is also why these locations tend to have the most ecological diversity. In deep water, riprap provides protection, but in shallower water, this habitat is also utilized as nesting locations for certain species like walleye. Many spring spawning fish will not be too far from their spawning locations at this time of year. Trolling is a good method of covering lots of area, attracting any aggressive fish. 
transitions, such as in composition of the lake bottom or from shallow to drop-offs, indicated here by the occasional boulders, are places where a lot of pisciferous fish will lurk, especially the lay and wait predators like northern pike. Living 10 to 25 years and not reaching sexual maturity until 6 to 10 years of age makes lake trout populations very slow growing and hypersensitive to overfishing, making other species, especially on trophy lakes, better candidates for supper. Without refrigeration, one must resort to alternatives. Keeping fish alive on a stringer allows one to better match the natural rhythms of animal movements, which are always unpredictable, without risking your health in a wilderness environment. Begin processing by slicing along the gill cover. Only with a bit of the tip Brace down the spine into the anal vent. Have blade flat against the spine and push through. Slide to where the caudal peduncle meets the caudal fin. Repeat. Lift the skin and muscle up. Run the blade flat against the spine until you hear the rib bones. Cut around them. Depending on the size and type of the fish, there might not be much meat to harvest around the ribcage. On walleye, don't forget to collect the cheeks. Start near the end of the tail to skin. Keep the blade at an angle and wiggle the knife to start the process. Once started, pull the skin, letting the sharp edge separate the meat. A 
Again, depending on the species of fish, one may need to contend with pin bones. They run along the lateral line. Completely deboning walleye requires two small cuts on either side. While holding on one side firmly, pull on the other side, and the bones will separate from the meat. Only a little waste is produced and is returned to the ecosystem. Vegetables take longer to cook. A simple tin foil side, potato sliced, sliced pepper, diced onion, minced garlic, salt, pepper, oil. Cook for 45 minutes to an hour. Coat the fish with some seasoned flour. This mixture is comprised of cornmeal, flour, and spices, such as salt and paprika. Shallow fry in oil. three minutes per side. Done when meat is flaky. Self-regulating predator-prey relationships develop with stable environmental conditions. Steady predation of prey species reduces intraspecific competition and increases growth rates of the prey species. Often, such growth also increases fecundity. If surplus of prey occurs, predator species will increase in number as well as intraspecific competition in the surplus species, yielding slower reproduction and growth. Thus, both prey and predator species numbers are reduced until the point when the cycle repeats. This cycle is reflected throughout the food web and how it's a reminder that we're only now visitors here. Dawn and dusk are generally when piscivorous fishes move into the shallow water. When zooplankton move upwards, benthic insects also are rising through the water column and flight and terrestrial aquatic insects are also increasing in activity and numbers. And so terrestrial animals take notice and move to the crepuscular rhythm. <laughs> 